What up nerds, my name is Luke. I help people interested in cryptocurrencies make some returns on their savings through the power of DeFi. So today I'm going to talk about a classic DeFi strategy called lending looping and I'm going to teach you how to make some monopoly money in a snail market. So how do you make monopoly money in this snail market and what the hell is a snail market? Well first things first, the strategy is simply you find a lending protocol that offers um, protocol rewards or incentive rewards on both the supply and the borrow side of the market. So what that means is when you supply some assets on this lending protocol, you'll get the natural yield, the real yield of interest paid by the borrowers, but the protocol will also pay you just to use the protocol. Similarly on the borrow side, you're going to pay the lenders to borrow those assets and then the protocol itself is going to pay you in their reward token to borrow and so if the rewards are high enough you actually can lend and then borrow the same asset and then use that borrowed asset to again lend and keep looping keep doing this to the maximum amount to completely farm the incentives of that protocol profitably so how you do this simply you lend it on token you lend a token and then you borrow that same token and then you loop it up to the max um, you do this on the same protocol and this is a pure incentive farming strategy so um, unlike the last video I did on lending arbitrage which is more of a real yield where you actually just um, taking advantage of the difference in interest rates this all you're doing is taking advantage of the fact that the protocol is uh, paying you high rewards so you're going to profit when the protocol incentives and rewards are more than the fees you're paying to the protocol and right what are the, and because if you think about this like if you lend and then you borrow from yourself <clears throat> you're just paying yourself to borrow fees but the protocol also makes you pay a little extra fee on top of your borrow weight to the protocol itself. So what it's doing is it's, it's paying you for, it's it's taking real asset, real fees, and it's giving you their fake monopoly money. Um, and so that's a simple strategy. And let me show you one protocol that I found where this strategy is still um, working. So this is actually a strategy that is was very popular during the bull market, during the bear market, the incentives and rewards and the value of all these tokens went very low and effectively a lot of the strategy became un uh, unprofitable. However, now we're in the snail market and now you can start finding more and more of these strategies starting to come. And, and then a lot of people are still innovating, a lot of people are still creating new protocols, um, a lot of new projects coming and with new projects they often have new tokens and new rewards um, so you can find some of these strategies so i'm kind of showing you simple old school strategy and hopefully you can take advantage of in the coming months so let's look so firstly this protocol is called radiant it's a lending protocol on arbitrum it's uh, forked from ave so that's usually a pretty good sign because of a has been exploited but it hasn't necessarily been hacked and it's reasonably safe code um so radiant is let's see so now to check the strategy what you want to do is you want to see first of all does the protocol itself have rewards is it paying out rewards and incentives and as you can see here both in the supply side you have the reward from supplying the asset through interest and you have the uh, APR that the protocol is paying you and now we check the borrow side see if we're getting some APR and you can see the APRs in the borrow side are actually quite high and um, see for example die here you're paying around 7% to the lender but the protocol is paying you 10% so you're getting a net 3 3% net to borrow so they're effectively paying you 3% to borrow however much you want to borrow all right, so what you want to do is you want to find something that gives you decent returns. Let's say DAI, lend your DAI to this market, go to the borrow side, borrow the same assets you want to borrow the DAI to the maximum amount, take that borrowed amount, go back to the deposit, deposit again. Now that you have more deposit, you want to borrow max again, and you keep doing that until you're unable to do it anymore. Um, 
So let's check how much you can actually borrow on DAI. So DAI, you see here, the maximum loan to value is 75%. That means the effective max leverage is, is four. So you can lever up four times as much as, as your initial capital. So if you have 1,000 to do this looping, you will effectively have 4,000 supplied and um, 3,000 borrowed. And the nice thing about Radiant is they have a little widget right here that will automatically do the looping for you. So you can look, you can click die. It tells you what max leverage you can have. You can leverage anywhere from one to four. And it tells you, then it does a little calculation for you to tell you how much your expected APR is. And for die, it's 26%, 26%. USDC, it's 25. And USDT is 35.6%. So you, this one actually is the highest. So if you're looking for a good return, it's this. But of course, you're taking on the risk of USDT compared to the other ones, which are considered a little bit more safe. All right, so next thing to consider is, are these rewards paid directly to you? Can you just claim these and sell them? Right, because that's what you really want to do. You want to farm these rewards, and then you immediately want to dump them for their equity so that you can kind of either compound it or just take those... Uh, returns and put them somewhere else. <clears throat> Radiant actually, unfortunately, doesn't just allow you to claim the rewards. What it does, it vests the rewards over a month's time. As you see here, you'll be your rewards will be vested and over a month, if you claim them early, you'll take a 50% cut, right? So you have to ask yourself the question, is it likely that these rewards, the value of the rewards, will they decrease by 50% or more? And if it's yes, if that's the case, if you think that's the case, then you should probably um, claim them early and take the 50% cut. And if not, if you think it's actually, you know, we're in a snail market, we're going to go sideways, these rewards are pretty much going to go flat, then maybe it's likely that you should just leave them locked and then claim them with no, no discount. Um, and if actually we look at the price of Radiant, this is the reward token. I mean, it's been pretty flat. Like it, it actually increased a fair bit in the last few months. Um, it wasn't a downward since it's created, which is pretty normal in the bear markets. This is the expected kind of um, trajectory, trajectory. And then it's it's basically flat. So, you know, if, if I was to do this strategy, then yeah, I would probably um, keep it locked and then just take the rewards without the discount because it's unlikely you're going to see this smash down another 50%. And if you do, then, you know, whatever. Um, it's it's in the expected range. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's get back to how we analyze this this position. So, of course, first things first, you got to consider the returns and costs. Um, it's pretty easy to do, uh, calculate the return on one of these types of strategies. You just basically add up the supply side APR. That's the result, the APR from the interest, that's the real yield, and then the APR from the um, incentives and rewards. And then on top of that, you add that to the, the uh, returns you're likely to get from the borrow side, <clears throat> which is basically the you take the borrow APR uh, incentives and then you take away the natural borrow side APR that you're going to pay, which is which is negative, right? And then you multiply that by the loan to value, um, which as with DAI was 0.75, with USDC it's 0.8, and then you divide that by one minus loan to value. So that that number right there is effectively um, your leverage, right? So one minus LTV uh, under under one is your leverage amount. So if you're going 4x leverage or 5x leverage, it's, it's effectively multiplying this APR by that value. Um, and next thing to consider is the setup costs. Now, if, you have, if you're doing it through Radiant, as you can see, you can just immediately loop it. But, uh, or if you're doing it through a flash loan, you don't have to you know, borrow and lend up to like 10 times um, manually. However, there is these kind of transaction costs in setting up this position. Uh, if you're doing flash loan, you usually have to pay pay something for that flash loan. If you're doing uh, manually, where you borrow and lend and you just keep doing that, looping it up, 
until you have your max position, then you have to pay all the transaction costs. So it can often be quite a lot to set this up and similarly to then unwind at the position, it also uh, costs a bit. I mean, there's more capital efficient ways of doing it, but if you only have, say, a certain amount of free liquidity, then um, to loop up, it's gonna, it's gonna cost some. So if you're, if you're planning to only hold this for a week or a month even, then you know you have to keep that in, into consideration of how much transactions, how much costs you're going to, um, how much that's gonna eat in, into your returns. Uh, and next, I wanna talk about the risks. Now this is the main thing I wanna talk about in this video. I wanna go over the different risks of DeFi investments and positions and strategies in general. And they, I think they go into about four categories. So you have asset risk, market risk, protocol risk, and chain risk. And the reason I have these split in four is because this is what you wanna diversify across in your portfolio, right? So rather than thinking about diversity as, ju uh, as just the number of positions or the number of different investments you have, you actually wanna diversify across each of these different components. For example, you can have 10, you can have, you can have 100 different protocols invested on Arbitrum, but if it's all on Arbitrum, then you have this single point of fav uh, failure if something happens with Arbitrum. Maybe there's some sort of weird um, bridge issue where a lot of assets now have become devalued and then your positions all become devalued. Or uh, there's some bug or some regulatory issues or whatever, you know, or just some unforeseen circumstance that affects only the chain, then this can destroy your entire portfolio. So you want to diversify across multiple chains, across multiple uh, protocols. You wanna diversify across assets that are correlated to the market and assets that are uncorrelated to the market. And then you also want to just have, you wanna at least, instead of having diversify across assets, maybe just minimize asset risk. All right, so specifically for lending, for this lending looping strategy, what are different things you have to think about for each of these different components? Well, first things first, let's start from the top, let's asset risk. So the things with asset risk, generally, if we're considering stable coins, like in the case of this lending protocol, is tail risks. Now these are the um, less frequent but high impact events and risks that happen that can just destroy the value of, of your asset or it can just affect the asset, which then affects the position. So one, Great example of an asset tail risk is uh, if it's a bridge asset, meaning if it's not a native asset to that chain and it's been bridged, then you have a point of failure of that bridge. If something happens, the collateral is taken from the bridge or there's a bug with the bridge or there's some sort of rug or just anything, right? If, if you have your asset, if you have your token connected to um, a custodian on a different chain or off chain, then you have this kind of um, counterparty risk, basically. And you've kind of exposed yourself to smart contract risk, which is different than if you have a straight ERC-20 token that's native to that chain. Similarly, you have regulatory risk for a lot of assets. For example, some of the safest, so seemingly safest stable coins, like USDC, uh, USDT, and BUSD, are all collaterally backed, one-to-one -one by the dollar, but because they are um, a single company providing these tokens um, with a single point of failure and that they're real companies in real jurisdictions in the world, they can be impacted by regulations and regulatories. You know, they are centralized, right? That's the big thing with decentralization. These things are not decentralized. So if some crazy change in regulation comes and it, it could effectively destroy your position, just so you have to consider that when you're thinking about what asset I should select and if I'm doing this looping strategy. Now the market risk, what's the market risk? Effectively none, right? If you're using a stable coin, it's uncorrelated to the crypto market. Obviously, if you're using Ethereum or Bitcoin to do this loop, then um, it is correlated to the market. Protocol risk, of course, is the major risk factor that determines whether or not um, this position is gonna be profitable, right? E you have, of course, your smart contracts, your bugs, and your rugs, which are standard to all smart contracts and dApps. Uh, something happens or some sort of issue, and then 
boom, your entire position is locked, or you lose most of it, or the value goes to zero. Um, another tail risk that you have specifically on lending protocols is this exploit risk. And this is generally, this. I'll try and explain this um, exploit, but basically these exploits can happen, and they have happened a lot, where the protocol ends up with bad debt because of the parameters or the incentives or the kind of mechanisms of the lending protocol allow a kind of bad actor to come in, manipulate the um, protocols and the pricing to borrow more than the actual value. For example, I'll pull up, um, not sure it'll work on Radian, let's say, let's see. So, okay, so for Ra Radian, you don't necessarily have to worry about this because what the exploit would do is manipulate the price of one of these assets. Um, it would say pump it, maybe double the price, three times the price, borrow hugely against that inflated price, you know, effectively draining the protocol of, of all the real assets. Um, and then you can do this exploit by either pumping the price up and you can do it by looping until you have uh, an a position that's like a, a synthetically large position. Um, maybe let's look at Sun Finance. This is another lending protocol on optimism. Now here you have ones that would have smaller market cap, for, for example, synthetics. If you could somehow manipulate the price of synthetics, like if you can find somewhere where maybe the, the where this is, this protocol itself might be finding its pricing from a couple of exchanges, what you can do, you can then find those exchanges, pump the price up, borrow massively against this uh, position that you have, and then borrow all the rest of the assets and kind of then let the price go back down and you you back away with, um, with all this extra debt. Now, if you can pump the price uh, or manipulate the price at less of a cost, then how much you can borrow, then it's a kind of free money exploit. It's a very profitable trading strategy. So you have to keep that in mind that some protocols, lending protocols on system, going to have these kind of exotic exploits that happen, that sometimes happen, sometimes don't happen. In fact, I was just researching one called uh, Lodestar or Lodesum or something like this. Um, and when I was creating this presentation to go through, and I was going to use an example of one of these places where you can find this strategy, where the strategy was live and the uh, rewards were quite high. However, just yesterday or the day before, um, it experienced one of these exploits. Somebody found a way to manipulate the the price of one of the assets and then just drained the protocol of all its uh, assets. And everybody who had assets on it just got screwed. Um, so keep that in mind, right? If, you, if you're finding these strategies, these incentive-based strategies, these are high-risk strategies because anywhere where they're paying you a lot to use the protocol, it's either very new or very high-risk because if it wasn't high-risk, a lot of people would use it and then those rewards would go down smaller, so small that it'd effectively be um, either not profitable or just... it would you'd be, like it would be neutral. It'd be a neutral risk, right? Um, but if people aren't going on there and taking all the rewards, it means that most people has assessed it as being very high risk. And finally, chain risk, right? This is also a tail risk. Uh, also has tail risks, right? Um, I can't think of any specific examples because I, it's to assess the tail risk of chains. It's often a lot more technical. Right, it would be down to the the technical implementations of the different chains, how they work and how they interact. Right, but you have to keep in mind that this is possible, um, that this could happen. Any of these chains, there, well, they are immutable, but you know, maybe you have centralization risk. Maybe uh, you think that all the proof of stake nodes, like there's multiple proof of stake nodes, and it's decentralized, but in fact. The majority, 60-70% of the nodes are all owned by a single organization. And in that case, then you have this massive risk that you didn't realize you had. So you always have to keep that in mind. Um, and the, the other chain risk, this is a, an interesting one. You have what I would call a transaction risk. This is when, on a lot of chains, when there is a lot of traffic, 
and let's say there's some sort of liquidity event like the prices crash and there's a massive hack uh, anything anything where people want to adjust their positions um, because of some sort of event the transactions become very very expensive right so if you're stuck in one of these positions if you're on, if you have a lending looping strategy something happens where you need to move your liquidity there's some sort of liquidity crisis where you have to move things around maybe the the interest rates massively change and now you're in a losing position on a lot of your different ones you have to move your money around but in order to do so now all of a sudden the transactions cost way more so in the times when you most need to move your money it's most expensive to do so so this transaction risk is, is quite interesting. Not a lot of people consider it when they think about setting up a position. So you might set up a position and say, oh, I think this is pretty profitable. However, you have to consider that what's the probability that over the next month or over the next year, I'm going to have to move this position. And in those situations when you have to move it, the costs are a lot more than the costs when you initially set it up in the time when, it, when there wasn't a liquidity crisis. So transaction risk, liquidity crisis risk, whatever. Um, this is a specific chain risk. And the reason it's a chain risk, obviously, is because the time when it's very expensive to move your assets on one chain, it's expensive for all your positions on that same chain. And finally, of course, the return is also proportionate to the token price. So if the token price goes down, if it goes up, it's going to change your return and the interest rates as well. So over time, naturally, token rewards decay and interest rates kind of balance out to what you'd see on the different protocols, right? To kind of reflect the um, neutrality of the risk, right? There's no really free lunch in, in this regard. So with all these risks, with all the little things, all the little different areas of the, each different component and all the different specific risks, you have to kind of think of a way of measuring this, right? So. As we saw with this specific radiant um, lending loop and strategy, it was, I think, 35% APR. But now let's consider, right, well, what's the probability that USDCT has some sort of issue in the next year? Maybe, maybe on Arbitrum, it's a bridged asset. Maybe it's not actually directly from um, Tether, right? Maybe there's a regulatory issue. Maybe MICA comes in in Europe and all of a sudden you can't use these things. Um, maybe the protocol, maybe the protocol starts, um, has there some percentage that there's going to be a smart contract bug. Maybe there's a 5% chance that somebody's going to exploit it, right? Maybe when it gets to a certain size, now they're a target for, or maybe they introduce a new asset and now they're, they have this exploit risk. And maybe there's just a... Uh, you're going to lose, on average, you also expect to lose maybe a couple of percentage to this transaction risk. And that's just the way it is, right? This is something you can't really avoid, that it's probably going to happen. The chain gets clogged, all chains get clogged, and it becomes expensive to do things. Um, so taking all these into account, you got to use your best judgment to think about what kind of probabilities you give to each of these events and if the... I guess the resulting loss of the realization of each of these events. You gotta consider all these things, add it all together, and then modify that APR. And I generally do that through an expected value equation. And I'm not gonna do it in this one, it'd be quite complicated. Um, I'm not super interested in, in this strategy, I just thought I'd present it to you. So I haven't done the specific um, math on this exact strategy on Radiant. All right. And, and finally, after you, so if you consider that, okay, it is positive expected value. I did my math, uh, you know, I evaluated all my risks. Um, I added it all together and I think, yeah, this, this is a profitable strategy. So where does this fit in my portfolio, right? Should I just have only this? I mean, if I'm getting 20%, 20 should I just have my whole portfolio, put all my money just in this strategy, right? So here's some things that I think about when I'm considering where it fits in the portfolio. All right, so you have your crypto market risks and you have your uncorrelated risks. The way, the way I think about uh, setting up a portfolio, I did a video on this, is you want to have some offensive assets, you want to have some defensive assets. Generally, the offensive assets are your investments, are your liquidity positions, are your short volatility positions. These are all the things that are the losses 
or the returns are directly correlated to the market, the crypto market, and your defensive assets are the ones that give you yield or returns that are completely uncorrelated to those those others, and these are the defensive. So with this specific loan, of course, you have some market risks. If we're talking about stable coins, we have regulatory and transaction risks. And why is that? Because um, the transaction risks generally happen when there's um, market turmoil. So in, the same, in an event where there's a liquidity crisis, that's because there's some sort of, you know, dump in the price. Now your assets are down, your liquidity positions are down, you have to move and rebalance. And now the transaction costs are also going to go up. So that, that's correlated. Similarly, regulatory, right? If some major regulatory um, change comes in that is going to affect the asset itself, that is a huge change. That's going to affect the entire crypto market, depending on the um, impact of that. Now, if, I mean, if it's USDC uh, or USDT and they are regulated in some way, that's going to send uh, ripple effects throughout the whole market. So that's very, very correlated to the to market. In fact, it's, it's causative of kind of downward price movement. Um, but there's also the uncorrelated risks. These are all the technical based tail risks. So, and as I said before, most of the risks or the major impacting risks to the profitability of the strategy and your returns in general on this strategy are all gonna be ones related to the protocol, related to the other kind of tail, tail based risks. Um, so I would consider this mostly a defensive strategy, right? Um, you can minimize the risks for the other one. For the regulatory and transaction risks, you can minimize those by choosing um, certain assets that you feel has the lowest risks. Um, you can minimize the transaction risks by making sure your portfolio is set up such that you're not gonna be affected by liquidity. And in these liquidity um, issues and cascades that your portfolio is, is set and you don't have to move money around too much. Um, so I would say it's defensive. So you can put this on 50% of your portfolio that's related to stable coins, stable coin farming, and all the other uh, uncorrelated uh, return streams that you might have. And finally, a little bonus, little bonus tip, do not buy Monopoly money. A lot of these tokens, they're completely useless. They're only used for um, paying out people for incentives. And the reason this strategy is profitable is because of these rewards and incentives, right? So wh where's this money coming from, right? It, the only reason it's valuable, the only reason you can get money from these rewards is by selling to someone. So someone's buying these, you know, terrible tokens that are just going to, going to zero. Someone's buying these and that's how you're making money. Right, so do not be the person to buy these tokens. Don't be that person for someone else. Um, that's a little bonus there. Uh, for Radiant, this is not really true because Ra Radiant is a token you can use to generate real uh, yield that's from the protocol. But a lot of the other cases, <clears throat> these are just monopoly money. Um, avoid these kind of tokens. So I hope you found some value. Uh, video is a bit long on quite a simple strategy, but just wanted to go over some extra little things to think about and um, some things you consider. So if you found some value, please like and subscribe and um, stay tuned for more content.